Um, my name is Tom Sitter. I'm the founder of the Advanced Technology Academic Research Center. And today we're going to uh, talk to the GSA, General Services Administration, about digital transformation. And uh, this is one of our ATARC Spotlight series. We love to talk to agencies, really kind of do a deep dive. And the timing is really good. We, at the end of last year, uh, we had a digital transformation event with NASA. We launched our digital transformation working group. And I'm just really excited. I think that a digital transformation is gonna be what every agency is gonna embark on if they haven't already uh, in 2021. As we found out with COVID, you've got to deliver your services in a different way. Um, you can't go wheel your 96 year old grandmother into the social security office. So really excited today for this. Uh, welcome all our attendees, special thanks to Dave Scheib, Beth Killeran, Erica Din, uh, Rachel Surik and the rest of GSA team to help pull this together. And now I would like to introduce our moderator, Mr. John, Dr. John Zangardi. John, you wanna come on? I think he's coming back on. So anyway, while John's getting on, he is a formerly the Chief Information Officer of the Department of Homeland Security, the U.S. Navy, and Department of Defense. And I don't know if anybody's had that trifecta in my memory, uh, which goes back fairly long. Uh, and John is also uh, the president of a company called Red Horse Corporation. And do we have you, Dr. Zangardi? Do you want to go off mute? Okay. Okay. There you are. There you are. Uh, uh, we're getting a little feedback, but John, I will uh, welcome. I will. I'll just turn it over to you. There's nothing like. Uh, technical difficulties as we've we've seen many a time on this I, we'll get him back here he's running he's uh getting on i think he's dr zangardi uh, hey hey guys i'm sorry uh it took the third try every time i called in i could not hear you so uh, okay well I, I said a lot of flowery things about you and I didn't add, I talked about your title and everything that you've done in the past. I didn't mention that you're also an ATARC board member, which is your most prestigious <laughs> title to <laughs> tell. Oh, that's funny. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. I appreciate it very much. And, and guys, I, I, I want to apologize for the confusion with me logging on. I'm sorry. Uh, today, I have the privilege of uh, being the moderator for this panel. I, I want to say as I start that it's a very distinguished panel and it's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to introduce uh, the first person in our panel who really doesn't need an introduction because you guys all know Dave Shive. Here's the thing, I, I have always thought of David as an innovator and a change agent. And for those of you who've worked in government, you know as well as I do, that is not an easy thing to do. But for the purposes of everyone who doesn't know him, he is the CIO of the US General Services Administration where he oversees obviously the IT operations and budget. And that's not an easy thing. He joined the GSA CIO office in 2012. Before that, he was the while well, before being the CIO, he was a director of the Office of Enterprise Infrastructure and the acting director of HR and FM systems for the GSA CFO and CPO. Before that, he was in the DC government as the CIO. He had executive responsibility for the agency IT operations. He did transformation there. He moved the uh, enterprise systems and processes to the public private cloud. That's great. He's got industry jobs. He worked in Lockheed Martin, overseeing large customer-centric IT organizations that their state, local, federal, and international customers. He's smart. Uh, he's got an undergraduate degree in physics. Mine's just an accountant. Uh, it's from the university, excuse me, California State University. He's got a master's degree in research meteorology from the University of Maryland and a postgraduate management certificate from Carnegie Mellon Graduate School of Industrial Management. That's really impressive chops. Also with us today, we have Beth Killerin. She's a Deputy Chief Information Officer for GSA. Prior to joining GSA, Beth served as the CIO for Department of Health and Human Services since, so, since 2015, where she also served as a Deputy CIO and Executive Director for the Office of IT Strategy, Policy, and Governance. So she is, like me, a DHS alum, 
where she served in the Undersecretary of Management, Chief Information Officer Office, and Citizen and Immigration Service and Customs and Border Protection. She started her career at Treasury and U.S. Customs Service. Uh, she holds a Master's in Technology Management from the University of Maryland, a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology with a Certificate in Personnel Management from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Erica Denny is the Associate CIO for Digital Infrastructure Technologies. She has served in several GSA positions, such as Deputy Chief Administration Services Officer, Assistant Commissioner for Organizational Resources, Chief of Staff Public Building Service, and Director of Workspace Delivery Program. She went to Harvard, where she studied at the JFK School of Government for Senior Executive Fellows. She's a graduate of the George Washington University uh, School of Business, and she is a Penn State alum. So uh, after introducing our panels, I'd like to turn it over to David, because I understand, David, you'd like to say a few words to the audience. So over to you, sir. So I'm going to uh, channel my best, David, because he's uh, a little bit delayed, but he will be with us in just a couple of minutes. So uh, first of all, for, for, thank you for allowing us to do a GSA Spotlight today. Uh, we're really excited about uh, being able to, to talk about our organization and you know some of the incredible things, and not only that we have been able to uh, accomplish uh, over the last few years, but some of the things that we're working to, to do in the future. Um, so uh, really just to kick it off, um, we really want to talk about, uh, you know, just give a little overview of what GSA is. Um, so as David always likes to say, we have, uh, we are the largest uh, land uh, manager. Uh, so we actually have uh, a number of different leases and federal buildings that our public service manages. Um, so we actually are the, the largest property manager in the, in the world. Uh, we have one of the largest fleets uh, providing uh, vehicles for use across the federal government. Uh, and, you know, we transact uh, multi billions of dollars every year for our federal agencies and partners. Uh, so what we love to say is, you know, we're really a shared service provider, uh, and we really are there to make sure that we are supporting all of our business enterprises. Uh, over the last uh, eight years, uh, they started an IT consolidation uh, that worked to uh, establish things that Fatara was thinking about, which is consolidating uh, all of the CIOs across the business line so that there is only one CIO at GSA. Uh, there are a number of associate CIOs that help to support those uh, businesses. We are excited about um, moving forward with not only what happened from the consolidation and what we were able to achieve through the efficiencies and economic uh, achievements we were able to accomplish, but we also are looking to move forward with the next generation through a digital transformation, which is really what we're going to focus on today. Um, and with that, we have a, a new contract that started yesterday that you'll be hearing about shortly and soon, uh, but we're excited about that. We have consistently had um, a strong customer satisfaction over the last five years. Uh, we sit around uh, between 88 uh, and 91% customer satisfaction across GSA to our customers. Uh, and as David likes to talk about it, those are kind of like you know Tesla and Amazon numbers uh, Google numbers, and we're really fortunate to be in that group. Uh, we also tend to have, you know, be in the high category, if not the highest in the up, upper three categories for IT organizations in the employee viewpoint survey. Uh, so we want to not only make sure that we're helping our customers, but our employees. And so with that, I will turn it back over to our moderator, uh, and we can get started with our questions, and we're looking forward to this today. Hey, Beth, uh, thanks for covering for David. Because of my technical difficulties, I didn't know he was there. So thank you for picking up the ball. So I think we're going to move to slide one. And here's the kickoff question. Uh, let's discuss how your office has had to adjust to the new norm of the coronavirus. What has been your focus during this time? And what challenges have you faced? I will let Erica take that. Sure. Thanks, Beth. Uh, you know, so so we we were lucky that we had a fairly telework ready organization, and I, I credit HR and our work with HR over the past decade to get that um, organization ready. Um, so we had modernized over the last couple, of, excuse me, over the last decade. And um, when this 
hid and we had a mandatory telework in March, we were able to go to 100% remote workforce overnight. Um, some of the challenges though that we realized immediately were that we had invested in some tools um, and technology to get into our environment without using VPN, although VPN is available. Um, we had employees that were very used to doing a routine way of getting in. And so um, over-reliance on VPN, I think was one of our biggest um, you know, uh, concentrations. And so, you know, other than adding an additional VPN gateway, which um, I'm not even sure if we needed it or not, but we spent a lot of time educating employees and um, uh, creating some self-service vignettes on how to get into the environment in different avenues. Um, and that really worked. Um, we also, um, invested in, you know, some of the other immediate focus areas for us were teleconferencing options. And so we had to look at a few different teleconferencing options, um, not only, not necessarily to meet internally, but more for the external uh, meetings that needed to happen. We have, uh, you know, our federal um, acquisition service provides some training for groups was in significant numbers, and we had to be able to accommodate for that. Um, and then we looked at team collaboration uh, platforms as well um, and invested heavily in that. Um, and again, that was um, uh, for some for internal use, but also really for the external use with our, our customer agencies. Um, so that was our big concentration. And, you know, and I would say, you know, we're going around doing the rounds of, um, of how's this going and how is it working? Um, and um, we've had a fairly smooth transition. You know, I'll also add, you know, one of our, our big, of course, concerns, which I'm sure many of our agencies struggled with is how do we onboard folks in a remote environment? And we were able to do a virtual onboarding, um, you know, 100% touchless and uh, roll that out within, I think about two to three weeks, working with HR, partnering with, with some of our other sister services, um, Office of Emergency Management. Um, so that partnership, you know, I think and those strong relationships really helped us um, have a fairly smooth transition. Thanks, Erica. Beth, do you have anything you want to add or do you want to move on to the next question? Yeah, we. I, the only thing I would say is I think all of us have learned uh, from this experience that, you know, how we perceive and how we communicate and how we operate when we're all in person uh, versus how, how we're going to, when we did things when we're all remote are different, right? How we do actually do collaboration, how we do communication and check-ins, you know, team building, for example, are very different. And as we move into the slide, you're gonna start seeing some of the things we're thinking about as we not shift to completely the way things were, but this hybrid environment of and making sure that we are thinking digitally for tomorrow. But the biggest thing that we're trying to strive for is, you know, different place, same experience. So no matter where you are, no matter how you choose to, to work at GSA in the future, every one of our employees will have that same type of experience inside and outside of the office. And with that, we can move to the next question. Hey, hey thanks, Beth and Erica. Next question on slide two, please, if you can move ahead. Uh, as we start a new calendar year, what are your top IT priorities? Um, so I think uh, David's still um, a, a minute behind. So I will just say that, you know, what we really have been thinking about is this is, has, was the five-year strategic plan um, that actually ended in 2020. And these, a lot of these particular goals are still the same. We want to make sure that we're delivering value um, and making sure that we're doing savings across our business lines and making sure we're providing uh, mission support services across the federal government. Um, and, you know, the, so the, the things around making sure that we're doing mission delivery and our people and our culture, cybersecurity, innovation, uh, and operational excellence are all still applicable, but it's exactly how we achieve those things that is evolving. Uh, one of the things that we had de decided and figured out even before COVID hit, uh, probably you know, six to nine months before that, which is, you know, we have kind of achieved a plateau with the, the model that we have. Um, we've been able to really be successful on having our, our structure and our delivery around our mission and our culture and mission uh, and around the mission delivery of having uh, assistant uh, CIOs that are specifically aligned to those mission and having a complete technology stack uh, on a mission by mission basis. But what we have determined is, is that for us, 
we can't just have an IT modernization, which is what kind of the, the first phase of GSA uh, IT has been under David's tutelage. We now really have to go under a digital transformation, which means instead of thinking this just from a true mission delivery perspective, how are we thinking about it from a product base, really looking at it on a shared service and digital platform? And with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Shive to add his extra comments since I see he has joined us. <laughs> oh, wow, right into the fire. Um, That's right, man. The, you know, I want to make sure just to get your five seconds of, of overall vision for the, for the session today. Great. Uh, thank you, everybody. And I am deeply apologetic for uh, being late. This is an important discussion, and I've been looking forward to it all week. Unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, but GSA has considerable work to do in response to the presidential transition. And uh, so my schedule has not been quite my own over the last uh, couple of months, and it's especially acute right now. Um, I've been looking forward to the conversation. I see that we're on the, you know, what's our strategic plan? What are the things we're going to be working on part? And, um, and so thanks, Beth, for kind of filling in while, while we waited or while I finished up my work. Um, you know, from the strategic plan at, at the very high level, we're just like any other IT shop. My, my primary goal is to support the, um, support the business mission of GSA um, through the use of technology, technology services, um, and information technology. And, and that part's not going to change. And our, our primary goal is, you know, we're, we're pretty big business enterprise. Um, you know, we're not the biggest agency in the world, but uh, overall, our uh, business enterprise is pretty big. We're a big design and construction company. We're a big property manager. We, you know, we do tons and tons of uh, billions of dollars of acquisitions on behalf of our federal partners. And, you know, we run travel and we run um, financial services and all these kind of shared services and stuff. And running the IT for that is, um, is uh, it, it's a big job. Um, but doing so, how we do so actually matters. And so we'll focus on making sure we have the best people for, to be able to do that. And we'll make sure that those best people are constantly trained and prepared for running IT as it exists during the start of the 21st century, but also as we expect it's gonna run um, in the future. We'll continue to shift our priority on from you know, making sure we run the best IT according to like traditional ITIL standards to making sure that um, our customers love us and that they will promote us to other parts of the organization and that they um, increasingly are able to focus all of their time and energy and mental capacity on, on the business mission of GSA and where IT becomes increasingly transparent, where it's just a thing that works and is intuitive and heuristic and, um, and, and meets their needs without them even knowing that it's there meeting their needs. Um, well, you know, we'll continue to make sure that, you know, the adversaries of the United States um, are not impacting um, the, the GSA computing enterprise and the, the GSA business mission, but also the computing enterprises and business missions of the agencies we support. You know, ultimately, we're a service provider to the rest of government and the things we do impact the entire federal enterprise. And so we'll make sure that we make good sound technology and cybersecurity choices that are reflective of that. Um, I say to my team regularly, we major on the major and we minor on the minor. We will make sure that you know, we run our IT very efficiently, that all the drives are spinning and all the lights, lights are blinking green instead of yellow and orange. Um, because when you do that well, it gives you the time and space necessary to be a little more forward leaning and think about the next new innovation that comes on. If you're not doing that basic stuff well, all your time is spent doing that. So we'll make sure we're operating excellent. Um, and then I think the last piece is, uh, I say pretty regularly, I have the best CIO job in the federal government. You know, John, I don't know if you'd agree with that or not, but um, it's, a, it's a place where I've had successive administrators um, allow me to um, take first move risk on behalf of the rest of the federal government. And uh, we get to try things out here at GSA. And then if things work well, we then look for scaling agents across government. 
know, through acquisitions or through direct technology engagements and stuff like that. You know, the, our strategic plan focuses on these kind of prime areas um, because we find that if we keep our focus on these areas, our customers are happy, our partners are happy. Um, the, we can confidently say we're being good stewards of taxpayer dollars and we're helping the federal government enterprise present a government to the citizens and visitors of the United States that we can all be very proud of. So that's kind of from the very top level, what our focus areas are. And then we'll get into some of the details, I think, for the balance of the discussion. Thanks, Beth. I appreciate it. Hey, David, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, I understand that when the boss calls, the employee runs. <laughs> yes, yes, sir. <laughs> So we get it, we get it. Um, so uh, keeping us on task, I'd like to move to slide three and uh, start on to our third question. And, and David, just for you and the rest of the panel's information, we're starting to get questions in and I'm reading through them. So uh, I may pepper them in before we go to another slide if it seems to fit the topic that you're, you're on right now, if that's okay with you guys. I think that's great. We love a bilateral two-way conversation. I think that's the most effective way to have these kind of conversations. Great. So on slide three, uh, you've talked about the importance of innovation. What are your continuing priorities around digital government and modernization? Uh, so I'll take that one. I'll give uh, uh, David a, a minute to catch his breath coming in. Uh, so the, the thing that we really are, are trying to focus on is, is really a, a shift in government. You know, as I mentioned at the beginning, there have been a number of agencies, including GSA, that have gone through a number of actual modernization of systems and incorporating new technology as they do that modernization. This is more of a digital transformation, which includes having to do all of these things that are on the slide. Um, I, I always love to give little analogies or accolades or, or little stories to make things a little bit more uh, meaningful and being able to relate to folks. So um, as we're thinking about, you know, building possibilities within GSA and, and acquiring solutions for tomorrow, um, I've started um, being able, watching uh, a couple of the old Star Trek shows. And if you think about it, and I Googled this the other day, is how many things there were on those shows, like 40 different things from cell phones to microwaves to um, to actually uh, 3D printing and other things that actually have come to fruition that were on that show. And really that's what we're talking about here of really how do we make that really things that people didn't feel were possible in technology actually come to fruition uh, at GSA. And this isn't just about information, it's about all technology. So you know, as we're moving on with you know, autonomous vehicles um, you know, drones, having smart uh, buildings. How do we incorporate that new cutting edge technology and being able to integrate it and innovate in real time or as near real time as possible? Understanding that it's not just an incorporation of technology, but you have to encapsulate the culture, the, the business process, the people in order to make that happen. And so we really are trying to think of this as you know, how we are going to shed our old business practices and processes and being able to revolutionize the business of GSA where technology becomes uh, a di starting digital and ending digital and getting rid of some of those old uh, practices and culture. Uh, so we really are making sure that we're integrating the people into this as much as possible because without it, we really will not have that true digital transformation. We're also wanting to make sure that we're doing sound partnerships uh, with our contractors, uh, including the, the new contract we'll be kicking off shortly, making sure that we're building on the successes of having a DevSecOps model, uh, making sure that we really are forward leaning, not in, moving from customer satisfaction to truly integrated customer experience, which we've been doing over the last couple of years, and making sure that we are able to evolve and address changing environmental things. I mean, we've definitely seen that over the last year, last month and last week, that things are changing pretty rapidly. And in order for us to do that, we have to make sure that we can pivot pretty quickly on technology. So we've got to have that great solid foundation that is digital that allowed us to pivot quickly for COVID, but able to continue to shift 
and looking at the technology that's here and on the horizon and what kind of building blocks we need to put in place so that we can actually realize some of that great technology that is here and coming soon. David, hey, do you want to add? Oh, Beth, uh, I, I, we're getting some questions in and, uh, and they apply to this particular area. And I'd like to throw them at the panel that as you answer, and I think Erica, you have a chance to respond. So I'm gonna mash together two questions from Jim O'Neill and Ramon ramirez Lenon. So uh, the, first, the questions are twofold. One is, hey, what is your vision for the cloud and how are you going to manage that? What is your current cloud footprint, if you feel, if you know that right now? And the other question is, are you using AI and natural language processing to help with the digital transformation effort? So uh, those are two questions from our audience, guys. Yeah, so maybe I'll start and then the team can fill in. Yeah, I mean, a CIO that doesn't know his or her cloud numbers probably shouldn't be CIO. So uh, the GSA perspective uh, uh, is um, for, uh, so it de depends how you define cloud. So I'll actually break it down to on-prem and off-prem uh, because off-prem can mean cloud, it can be managed service, things like that. Um, so for uh, cloud workloads, um, it, we are 51% uh, uh, cloud and another 22% off-prem using managed service. So 73% off-prem the remainder is on-prem. And the um, cloud uh, spend is roughly the same, maybe two or three percentage points uh, off for each of those, but it didn't start out that way. Our initial cloud investments were um, actually much more expensive than our on-prem, um, but we've worked very closely with our industry partners to draw those prices down. So they're basically the same as on-prem uh, utilities. So roughly 30, uh, 73, 74% is off-prem. We will continue to look for targets uh, to move to the cloud, um, but we will also be smart about it. You know, ultimately I'm a steward of taxpayer dollars and I'm ob obligated to spend those dollars in the highest value places. Sometimes that's the cloud. That's not the case 100% of the time. And so we will be very thoughtful about what remaining workloads move to um, the cloud, which we choose to continue to work in kind of a hybrid environment. And some percentage likely for the foreseeable future may remain on-prem. Um, so that's kind of uh, where we are on the cloud side. For use of AI, you know, uh, we've been heavy users of AI and machine learning um, for four and a half or five years. We started in some very predictable places um, to, to gain a lot of maturity there, you know, like in the cybersecurity place, you know, things like that. Um, we have uh, uh, right now probably 25, 26 uh, AI engagements uh, running in either pilot or MVP or full on production within GSA. Remember, we're a mid sized agency, we're not like DHS or commerce or something like that. Um, we got we have another 15 or so in the pipeline. Um, in classic GSA fashion, we will continue to look at um, augmentation and other forward-leaning technologies and assess their suitability for um, for use within the GSA computing enterprise. But we're also very specific and intentional about doing that in two ways. One. We want to make sure that emerging technologies are well suited for the GSA mission space. Um, you know, we look at the same thing with quantum computing. We'll see, is it suitable? Some would say if you're transacting billions and billions of dollars of acquisitions with supply chain risk management issues and things like that, probably quantum does make sense. But, you know, we'll be making those determinations uh, over the, the short term future. The second reason that we do that is one, we got to be you know, honorable with how we make our investments in time and people and money in those domains. But the second piece is we recognize that the larger federal enterprise expects us to take what we learn in that and expose it out to the rest of the federal government. And, um, and so when we um, do these engagements, we're always kind of casting a wary eye towards what else is happening in the federal enterprise and where can we scale any of the good outcomes that we get in our pilots and our MVPs and our initial um, production level um, entries into these spaces 
where can we scale them out through communities of practice or through playbooks? You know, it's no surprise that we are deeply in, entrenched into things like the AI community practice and partnership with the Jake uh, and places like that. We are intentionally in those spaces so that we can try things out here in GSA um, and then look for scaling agents like federalized acquisition um, or direct technology engagements to work with our federal partners across government. Great question. It was. Thank, thanks, David. Moving, moving on to the next question, because I want to keep us on schedule. What challenges did you face in terms of digital transformation? Are there cultural, technical, or other issues that make it hard to fully leverage your emerging IT resources? And there's an interesting question that aligns with this from the audience, from Amy Fadita. Uh, she is interested in understanding how uh, you balance digital trans transformation technologies with customer adoption to get at and ensure the best customer experience. Yeah, that's a good question by Amy. It sounds like she's been around the block a few times. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so um, I would like to say, I like the question, what challenges did you face? Uh, I'll edit the question just a little bit to say, what challenges did we face and do we continue to face? Uh, in the same way that you know, we use a CI/CD model, continuous integration, continuous delivery model for delivering new business capability through the use of technology here in, in GSA, we find that the challenges follow the same model. They are always there, ever present, and always kind of changing and morphing with the times. That's a practical reality of delivering in a large enterprise like, like a government agency. Um, the challenges are early on in the adoption life cycle were focused on what is this newfangled thing? It's a risk to the status quo. You know, we, you know, what are these IT people trying to do to me? They're trying to disrupt something. GSA from the business standpoint actually has done a pretty good job for a pretty long time. And there are, so there's a lot of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it mindset within GSA. Um, but we're all about, you know, becoming increasingly efficient, not just maintaining the status quo. So what we had to do is find those who kind of were a bit resistant and um, enter them into the program delivery teams. You know, I think Beth mentioned earlier, we use DevSecOps. We've actually been doing derivatives of DevSecOps for um, probably seven or eight years now. Um, and so one of the things you do is you get some of the people who are, are, are struggling with this and you make them a part of the delivery team. Um, and they, they learn through experience, experiential learning by getting in there and practicing and they see the value. And once you see the value, it's pretty hard to um, ignore it and continue to, to fight and rail against it. One of the challenges, then I'm gonna turn it over quickly to Beth and Erica for a little bit of context. Most people know that we're, you know, we've been pretty forward leaning when it comes to digital services and the digital landscape at GSA for a long time. I think what you'll hear through some of the balance of the discussion is uh, the realization on our part that we're really a digital version 1.0 type organization. We don't have a lot of paper running in the organization. Mm -hmm. We've digitized the vast majority of, of, the, of the assets, the intellectual assets of GSA. But a lot of those are first gen. You know, they're basically digital copies of existing paper processes. Um, and that's great because we can do it out online and it makes securing it that much easier and all that good stuff. But the work now is to, like Beth mentioned earlier, take those digital assets that we've been able to create and the digital tooling that we've been able to say and make sure that GSA as a business unit is op operating in that digital environment in the most effective, optimal way. Um, and that means business process re-engineering foundations for some of those um, nascent digital processes to truly become a digital organization that not only can see um, things like an acquisition or a rent billing uh, thing go through its life cycle, but we have the digital wherewithal to have a positive effect on it as it's moving through its life cycle. And so we can do deep and meaningful analysis on the digital outcomes as it's going through its life cycle and at the end, and then derive efficiency into the process. All the great, great values of 21st century digital business. Um, we're excited to do that. It's going to be an exciting couple of years as we go to kind of what we call digital version 2.0, where we are true, a true end-to-end -end digital entity. Great. David, 
Better. So I would say, you know, in addition to that, from the, the challenges perspective, you know, it's all, it's all around sequencing, right? Um, so we have to make sure that we're partnering with the right parts of the organization that truly really are ready for the next level of digital uh, expansion and making sure that just with anything and how uh, IT programs are successful, which is, you know, kind of starting small and then expanding and increasing our velocity as we grow. Uh, we have a couple of organizations that tend to be a little bit more tech savvy or wanting to, to shift to new technology faster. Uh, as you can imagine, our organization has a lot of daily interactions uh, with a number of, of big tech companies. So they already have their finger on the pulse of things that are coming. And there are parts of those organizations that are always kind of pushing us to even go faster sometimes you know, than, than we're ready for. And so we want to make sure that we're finding those right opportunities, figuring out how to, to test and, and fail quickly if we need to, show the success and value uh, of some of those digital capabilities, and then increase the velocity across the organization. The other part of this, though, is, you know, from the cultural perspective, how do we make sure not only is the tech ready, but the people to use the tech? So we have really been investing uh, over the last year in changing the model by which we train. Uh, we have actually started implementing shorter, smaller kind of video vignettes to our uh, employees on being able to learn things in smaller segments. Uh, as adult learners, we tend to have very short attention spans. So saying you're gonna watch a video for an hour, uh, people just don't have that time in their day. So let's talk about the things that they really need to know for these applications we're putting out, short, putting those vignettes, and then also the level of communication. One of the things we found for cultural changes, many times we think that we have over communicated and still the community doesn't know about things that are happening. So we're really changing how we're communicating to make sure that we are providing that right skill set, making sure that people understand are ready for the change so that it doesn't have a, a cultural clash as we put these capabilities in. And then the third thing is, is both within our organization and across the organization, what kind of upskilling uh, do we need to have to make sure that the skill sets that we have for the folks today, they may be applicable for the jobs that they have, but as the, the jobs evolve and become more digital in nature, what other skill sets do we need to be incorporating so that they can change uh, as the technology with their, with their job goes? And with that, um, Erica, if you would like to go ahead and kind of give a perspective of some of that upskilling based on where you've been sitting over the last year. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, it's a great introduction of, of um, digital transformation just involves way more than the technology, There's certainly the organizational component and um, the workforce perspective to consider. And um, just from a, a workforce perspective, you know, as we started to roll out agile methodology and DevSecOps, um, we, we certainly received um, some of the challenges with the workforce were saying, um, you know, I, I'm not necessarily trained in this, you know, I have a traditional background and um, and so what we did is we took a, a coordinated approach and we centralized um, you know, all of our conference training, for example, um, and our training and looked at it from a bird's eye view um, and really talked to the employees and we surveyed them. And we went out and, and, and directed them and said, hey, do you need training in these you know, three or four areas and, and what might be the other? Um, and we found out really where their interest was. Um, and we, uh, we rolled out, for example, an agile 101 and 102 training um, and extended coaching, for example, in a year. Um, it, it just as a result, you know, our, our EVS scores, by the way, went from the low 70s um, to the high 80s in one year, just as a result of that particular upskilling effort. Um, and so we've been continuing that year after year. And then the conference training is another area where we, we coordinate with our CTO, we coordinate with some of the other um, emerging technology areas and figure out where do we want to uh, focus our training dollars that year. Um, and we centralize that and look at, um, you know, spread that around and make sure that training is being conducted in all areas um, and that, uh, you know, not the same people are going year after year to particular conferences um, and then bringing that back and sharing that. Um, we also do tech talks leading from, leading from your position. So if you have a particular technology or expertise that you want to share with the rest of the organization, we hold um, their monthly 30 minute tech talks and you can share anything that you might want to share with the rest of the organization that's been really successful. Um, so that's another component we've pushed over the last um, couple of years and it's, it's just been highly successful. Hey, thank you, Erica. Uh, moving on to the next question. 
Are there any large projects or other infrastructure offices working on that are key to your digital transformation? And there's an add on here from the audience from our friend Jason Miller. He's talking about innovation here, and he'd like to know your opinions. I think it, it fits into this question on whether they think GSA or the government more broadly is closing the innovation gap with the private sector. There's a perception out there that government's way behind, but you know, from, your, from where you guys sit, do you think that is the case or not? So over to you guys. Yeah, so I'll start. I, I can, go ahead, David. I'll, I'll start with Jason's question and then turn it over to Beth and Erica on the project level stuff. Um, so really good question, Jason. I, I spend actually a lot of time with private sector CIOs. Um, and I, I gotta be honest, when I'm talking with them and I talk about the GSA experience, um, it is more often for me to hear from them, wow, you're light years ahead of us, than it is not. Um, it depends on the type of organization you're talking to. If you're talking to Mary's plumbing shop, then yeah, we're probably light years ahead of them. If you're talking to Google or somebody like that, maybe not so much. But by and large, when I'm talking with Fortune 100 CIO, company CIOs, um, there is certain parity with what government is doing. Many of the issues that we face are, are very similar, um, and, but many of the successes uh, that we've had in government those CIOs are still trying to solve within their organizations. So do I think that we should stop that the race is won? Absolutely not, absolutely not. But our mission area is a little bit different than the private sector. Um, and, but I think that uh, uh, the days where government was lagging far behind the commercial sector and commercial sector best practice, I think those are rapidly coming to a close. Yeah, I would agree with you there, David. I mean, uh, you know, we have labs that are already working on quantum computing. We, you know, NASA is working technology solutions that not only now uh, take a, a spacecraft uh, into space, but, you know, lands part of the module safely back on Earth and are planning on, you know, how to safely set up a, a moon base so that they can get to Mars. I mean, these are some pretty innovative technologies that are, that are necessary. Uh, and I definitely think that the, the federal government is not all the way there, but there are definitely sectors uh, that are right there lockstep with, with industry. From our perspective here at GSA, uh, we do have a number of, of capabilities and things that we're moving forward with. Kind of the first thing that we are kicking off with our digital transformation is, as I mentioned, we really have uh, built our organization traditionally around making sure that we provide business delivery. So we have um, organizations that have kind of the full stack of capabilities uh, to deliver for a particular individual business. But as you can imagine, when we're thinking about how to increase the velocity and become more innovative overall, that requires to us to have some investment capital. So when we look across those business units, we find out that there are some common product lines that every one of our businesses need. So we actually have established and have done some realignment within our organization for our ACOs, not just to provide uh, solutions for a particular business, for, but for shared services. So we had a question about cloud. That's one of the areas that we have already established as a cloud product line. Uh, we actually have established um, a product line for identity and credentialing. Uh, we have a couple of other shared services that we're going to be launching uh, that are already uh, in their beginning stages. So we're looking at not only technology from a vertical perspective, but also making sure that we have that horizontal, which allows us to not only have uh, better systems to systems integration, but then allows us to be able to increase the velocity by having our systems be able to better integrate not only from uh, a true technology perspective, but able from a security perspective, and more importantly, from a data exchange perspective. So the second kind of element goes with that, which is making sure that we are building the right cybersecurity tools. Uh, we have a, a, a CISO who is very forward leaning. We have a, a, actually, that's our first place that we, we're using artificial intelligence. We have a pretty small staff, so how do we augment the cybersecurity with the right tools and innovations so that our practitioners are able to focus on those anomalies 
and those areas where they really need to have eyes on the, the problems and the solutions and allowing the technology to help with our cyber hygiene, with our monitoring and our detection capabilities to protect our organization as it moves forward. The other aspect of that is, is you know, as we protect our data, uh, we also have to share our data. So how are we looking at the totality of our systems? And we've put some things in place using open source and other capabilities that allows us to have better data integration because we wanna make sure that we're making the best decisions for ourselves, but more importantly, helping to advise our leadership and having the, that leadership advise their customers. We really wanna make sure that we're putting the right capabilities in from a data management perspective, not to look at the past data, but helping to look at the data, the data for today so we can have real time decision-making, but even more importantly, putting that right predictive analytics help us plan for the budgets and, and the services of the future. As we've seen over the last you know, year or so, you know, the environments change and we have to be able to put the right models and capabilities into our systems using open source cybersecurity and data so that we can bring that information in, add those models and capabilities so we can do the right predictive analytics to help us plan for what products the agency should be providing to our customers in the future and building our budgets accordingly so we can be as efficient uh, with the taxpayer dollars as possible. And with um, that, Eric is gonna talk about one a, a specific uh, infrastructure project or two that's happening uh, within the organization. So Erica, take it away. That's right, Beth. Yeah, so one of the, one of our key projects that we're launching is our, um, it's our infrastructure capabilities and IT operations contract. Um, it's an enterprise wide contract. We're on our fourth generation of it, um, this particular, contract is structured differently than in the past, which would, which you, you may have um, you know, seen a traditional infrastructure support contract. And this is designed to push down those operational costs and partner with um, our new contractor uh, to introduce uh, some of these you know, innovative ideas and move to, move to a digital organization um, and introducing innovation. Things like AI, RPAs, um, we are getting into, we're, de we're going to be designing automated personas, for example, and using AI um, to, uh, to develop those personas so that we can um, get into predictive analytics and predict um, some of the actions that we're taking might result in these two or three options and it'll help us make some better decisions. Um, but by pushing down those operational costs, it'll let us reinvest in some of these areas that Beth just mentioned. Um, you know, a couple of, of just a key things that we're looking for in this particular contract, uh, customer experience. Um, we're moving beyond customer satisfaction. It's really important, but we're moving to that idea of customer experience and um, creating that omni-channel intake uh, process and tools and to be able to provide that shared service capability. Um, you'll hear Beth and David talk a lot about shared services and you know, that notion of being able to provide that through one channel and having um, you know, the idea of a customer champion, for example, to do all the backend um, coordination um, so that the customer is really only having that first experience um, through that intake process. It, you know, is really a key way to reduce duplication, um, drive down costs, uh, eliminate inefficiency and things like that. And so we're looking forward to that. Um, you know, enhancing business value, we should be able to use some of those dollars that we're saving through driving down those costs to reinvest back into um, areas that it help the business deliver their mission. Um, and then we're looking at, this is going to be a net zero budget impact. And this particular contract is different in that We've structured it so that the contractor is rewarded based on the innovative ideas at a net zero budget um, that they can produce. Um, we're looking forward to it. And, you, know, you mentioned the idea of um, where is the you know where are you in in relation to the private sector? And um, you know we just had a, a meeting with our our new contractor, um, and it was a half day kind of kickoff. And it was interesting. One of the comments out of those meetings is that they're really excited to work with us and and impressed with not only the, um, the culture, but the partnership that we expect um, to enter into and, and some of the um, forward-looking um, outcomes that we're looking for in this particular contract. So it's pretty exciting and a real tangible um, project that we're working on in relation to this. Hey, thanks, Erica. Uh, moving on to the next slide and the next question. Um, today, we have attendees from government, academia, and industry, all thinking about the digital landscape. How are you using new and emerging technologies to build GSA's digital transformation? And there's 
two questions from the audience that, that fit into this. One from John Reinemann, I hope I pronounced it right. He's interested in how are, you, how are the users in GSA accepting what you're doing? And Stacy Swan is uh, interested in how you're pushing to reduce friction in acquisition processes. Right. So great, thanks, John. So uh, just for awareness, while Beth and Erica, since I know this stuff already, while they were answering some of the questions, I was actually answering some of the questions. So go take a look at the answered questions because um, uh, there's some additional context in there since we are running reasonably short on time. So um, how are the employees uh, taking the innovation landscape that we're presenting to them? Um, they love it. They love it. I mentioned uh, our customer uh, satisfaction scores, our customer experience scores, our NPS scores. Um, our customer experience scores over the last five years, as we've been really doubling down on MVPs of digital transformation to literally full on agency wide digital transformation that allows us to be, you know, 74% off prem, that kind of stuff. Um, uh, our satisfaction scores in that time have gone from the low 70s up to it bubbles are along between 89 and 91 percent, depending on the year. Um, it is hard to deny that. They also love it that we're saving a ton of money by doing so. And uh, and we're able to reinvest that money back into the business of GSA or into additional transformation plays. So in that regard, the the it's a it's a thing that feeds on itself. You know, you start with some small wins and some targeted areas, get some good results there. That starts to breed a little bit of excitement. Eventually, um, the whole agency is excited. And even more so, the excitement uh, extends beyond the four walls of GSA and it becomes an attractor of talent into the organization. And that's where we are now. We have people walking away from half a million dollar a year jobs to come work at GSA because they're so excited not about the GSA mission. I mean, we're purchasing agents and facility managers, but they're excited about how we do our work. And we're ex they're excited to be a part of an organization that's presenting government in a much more effective way to, to the citizens we're serving. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad to hear there's people from government, academia, industry, military, you know, the whole kit and caboodle here. Um, like I mentioned a little bit earlier, we actually use emerging technologies as a lever for getting um, driving innovation and transformation into the organization. You know, we have a mature enterprise architecture team that that takes a look at emerging technologies and say, where does it fit into the existing enterprise architecture? And then in the reverse of that, where do we need to modify and change our emerging, I'm sorry, enterprise architecture to accommodate new and emerging technologies? Um, and you know, sometimes that looks like machine learning. Sometimes that looks like AI. Sometimes it looks like more traditional things that we've been doing for 30 years, scripting and robotic process automation, even though that's a new name for a very old thing. Um, uh, but, uh, but then sometimes it looks like very practical things. Can we do the work of GSA, meaning the entire mission of GSA from outside of the four walls of the buildings of GSA? Uh, are we truly... 100% uh, virtual, 100% mobile enabled workplace. And if we're not, what do we need to do to get there? Um, you know, this has been kind of the, the, the regular, the norm at GSA for years and years and years. And once you get to that critical mass where it just becomes the norm, it creates an environment where the entire community wants to continue to, um, to do that. Like right now, we, we're focusing on AI and ML and um, and uh, we're taking a deep look at um, quantum computing and stuff like that. But there will be new things that come in the future. And our goal is to not create an environment that's AI and machine learning ready. Instead, our goal is to create an environment that's agnostic to technology and that can, where we can infuse in and plug in and plug out technologies as they prove their utility to government, government operations, government um, uh, processes. And so that's kind of our primary focus, why I started with enterprise architecture and I'll finish with the enterprise architecture. You know, we spend tons of time building a modular capability on the people and the process and the underlying technology so that it doesn't matter what that new thing is that's coming down the pike, it's reasonably easy to plug it in and plug it out. Um, John, there was one other small question in there. 
uh, oh, acquisition. Yeah, uh, on the acquisition. Yeah, on the acquisition side. Yeah, we're always looking to reduce friction. We're kind of the acquisition arm of the federal government. Um, we actually use ourselves as a proving ground for acquisitions. As a matter of fact, many of the um, acquisition products that the Federal Acquisition Service generates on behalf of the rest of the federal government got their start in places like GSAIT, where we learned and hacked through some government bureaucracy, got, got a better outcome, and then scaled it across government. We're always looking to do that. Um, and we're also open to suggestions and recommendations from the community on how we might be able to do that as well. All right. Hey, hey, David and, and the rest of the panel, we are we got about 20 minutes left if we go by the schedule. So I'd, I'd like to move on to slide five and the next question, unless there's an objection. No. Nope. Okay, so let's move to slide five. And here's the question, guys. What advice do you have for other agencies starting their digital transformation? Sure. Thanks. And I, I can take this. Um, you know, one of the thing, one of the areas, you know, it, it, that we talk about a lot, assured services, you see that there, but um, that idea of consolidating functions um, so that you're eliminating duplications. Um, we, we did a consolidation, I think it was about four years ago. It is a journey. I mean, you see the, I think we've had two slides now with a road, you know, for example. So it is a journey. Um, but when we did it, I think um, our staff, uh, you know, when you look at IT staff across the agency um, reduced by uh, just over 30%. And I don't know if I, David knows this number, but our, our budget numbers have reduced um, by about 28%, maybe a little bit more. Um, and during that time, we've increased our, um, our customer base. We've increased the amount of systems we support. Um, and we've taken on more work. So reduce budget, reduce staff. And so when you can find those areas to reduce duplication, it does make it easier to um, create governing bodies, um, to uh, reinvest dollar savings, to make some decisions based on the organization. Um, you can still have different customers you serve that have different missions and different transformation journeys. Um, you can create business portfolios to address that. Um, but uh, the idea is to really look through and, and think through, and it takes some time, um, how you can consolidate um, to eliminate some of that duplication. Um, you know, the other piece of it, uh, Amy brought this up earlier, uh, customer engagement. So spending time with your customers and explaining digital transformation. Um, you know, uh, you know I, I use that term omni-channel and take process. It's a really scary term. You know, when I talk with customers, a lot of people, the first thing they say is, I don't understand IT. Um, and so we have to make it tangible and under, and relatable to them. Um, and, and just a good story, I, you know, I was in a, I hit a deer in the middle of the road in a rural back road um, where I live and had to contact uh, the insurance company. Of course, you know, here I'm dealing with children at late at night, last thing in the world I want to do. I had a busy day the next day and I thought this is going to be the worst, you know, experience having to contact, I haven't contacted um, insurance in forever. Um, and you know, the next morning I called and some woman named Rebecca answered the phone and said, great, I'm gonna do this for you. Um, she said, send me some pictures. And, and you know, as a result of those pictures, she had a quote, she had the, you know, the company lined up where I was gonna take the car. She had a rental car for me, it was all done, everything. Um, and, and I thought, oh my gosh, this is a great way to describe digital transformation. You know, I didn't have to coordinate. In it. And from what I remember the last time I called the car insurance, you had to coordinate that all yourself. Well, no, she had it all available at her fingertips. Where do you want to go? Um, she's looking at it online. It was all very easy. And so if we can create that relatable experience for our customers to be able to engage with us and talk about digital transformation in terms that they might understand um, and bring them along in the journey, um, it's kind of interesting, you, you know, you, you share that with them and then they see articles um, relating to their business and then they start to read them and then they start to engage in that conversation and it really opens up that conversation. So um, talk with your customers, create that partnership. And, um, and customers, by the way, I, you know, I, I include the, our heads of staff, uh, sister services. So your CFO, your, your HR office, really important partners to engage with um, on this and have them understand what this journey looks like and where the goal is. Um, another area that I, uh, just in terms of, of advice would be, you know, every mission, every organization has a different mission and obviously IT is a support organization. We're here to enhance business value and to meet the mission of the agency. And so having a strong understanding what that mission is and how you can particularly enhance the mission, enhance the business value, it's it's going to look different for everybody. So. Um, so it's, it's, not a, it's not a complete standard roadmap of, of you know, pick one, 
one agency or one company and model it. It's really thinking through what, how does it make sense for where you sit within your organization. Um, and then, uh, you know, the culture piece, I, I, I can't, I, I come from a workforce perspective, so I have to spend some time on making sure your workforce is prepared um, and potentially looking at, are you organizationally aligned to perform it um, and pushing through cultural norms, um, you know, such as adopting DevSecOps principles and agile. Um, uh, and then creating some, you know, just some overarching criteria for yourself on, um, you know, some of the things that we looked at from our digital uh, you know, journey are, uh, we have to have secure systems. Um, our systems have to be reliable. They have to be scalable to new requirements um, and have standards that, that we're gonna, you know, what makes sense to us. And so that's what I would, would recommend where you start. Um, and I'm always happy to share, you know, on an offline basis, um, our experience and, and share a bit more in detail about that. Hey, thanks, Erica. Moving on to the next slide, unless anyone has anything they want to add to that. Okay, let's move on to slide six. Uh, you've highlighted the importance of shared services as part of your larger digital transformation initiative. What is GSA doing in the area of shared service? And Anish Patel has asked the question of, uh, are there new or what new GSA services might you offer to your customers uh, sort of in a post COVID environment to accommodate a future work from home uh, or anywhere kind of uh, uh, world. Hey Beth, you were gonna take that one. All right, so uh, I think what we're, what we're talking about and what David and both Erica have talked about is, you know, we have to balance the foundational capabilities uh, which are common across the organization with some of the new cutting edge things that our customers need in order to uh, continue to meet the expectation of their customers and the challenges of the government, uh, especially as the environments changes, budget situations change and whatnot. So the, the shared services that we're bringing forward uh, that are on this slide, and then we can kind of flip to the next slide since we have a little bit short on time, is, is really focusing on those kind of cross organizational pieces and parts. So what we wanna make sure that we're doing is, is that we not only focus on you know, the things that we need to have across the board that everybody has heard about multiple times, you know, cloud, data integration and data analytics, making sure we're doing document management, uh, making sure that we also have a, you know, same start of customer uh, intake process and experience, but how do we make sure that we're doing those things with some of the new services that we have? So one of the things that um, Erica has been kind of alluding to is one of the initiatives that uh, GSA as a whole is taking on, which is um, you kind of the, the workplace of the future or our digital workplace. And so that is an initiative that, that GSA has been taking on. And obviously IT has been uh, an integral part of that group, but it's, it's much larger even than ourselves. And how do we think about this as a shared service within our organization, a part of that overall ecosystem of services that are being applied across the organization. Um, and with that, as we think about these services to move to our digital capabilities, we also need to make sure that we're thinking about um, our workforce of the future and what we're going to do around that. So the slide that you have around here kind of is that 360 uh, what we're doing around our workforce. Um, we've had a couple of examples that Erica and David have talked about, which is you know, moving forward with upscaling some of our folks, but this really is not just around upscaling individuals and training people that'll be using our system. It's making sure that we know within our organization, the way that technology works and is successful, it starts and stops with the people. We need to make sure that we have a clear vision uh, that we communicate from our from us down and across and up um, across all of our organizations within our organization and within our customers and what we're trying to achieve here and why and what's the value to our organization to do that we need to make sure that we're looking at the workforce and the changing landscape i said of of the technology uh, when i first started you know we had a, a bunch of people that did different kinds of things uh, when I was at uh, Customs, there were tons of radio operators. Don't see too many radio operators around anymore, right? So how did those people change into, you know, 
uh, people that run mainframes. Don't have too many mainframes in there. Okay, so we're not, not, maybe not doing a lot of COBOL, but there is still some out there. So how are those folks changing to the next capability? That's what we're talking about. How are we looking at the folks that we have today and the skills that need to be shifting because the technology is shifting? And then integrating and talking to our staff on areas that they have interest in making sure that we're building those development plans to be able to change those skills so that we have just in time delivery and they're being able to be parts of those solutions as we build them. And in areas where we still have gaps, how are we augmenting that by either recruitment process and, and working with our HR uh, community to accelerate hiring or in areas where, you know, maybe the government is just not going to have that core competency that we're contracting for them and making sure that we're continuing to think about how we're managing those careers, giving people opportunities. Uh, one of the great things about GSA is, you know, we usually have anywhere from 10 to 20 percent of our staff doing some type of rotation so that they are having real world experience of different kinds of, of either technology, other parts of the organization, so that we help to rebuild their skill sets, most importantly, but increase our retention rate because they know that they have the ability to broaden their wings to see what other things are out there and adjust as they want to. And then again, making sure that we're building that talent management capability from the ground up. Uh, this is kind of Erica's bread and butter. It's actually uh, something that she's been very passionate about. So. I'll give her a, a few seconds to kind of chime in to see if there's any things that she wants to highlight from the uh, the people perspective before we move to slide nine. Yeah, it, just the only other thing from a people perspective. So we launched a rotational program um, a couple of years ago that's been highly successful. So I talked about the training and the conferences and one of the areas I felt very um, passionate about was on the job training. So uh, you can go to a training session, but so, you know, how do you implement that on the, come back and, and do that on the job? And so um, we started, when we first started, there were a couple people maybe interested and, and I had a goal of, of 10%. Um, and I will say maybe a few people laughed at me. You know, I wanted 10% of the organization on rotation at any one point in time. So taking their experience from their position today and working in a different area, um, and, and I think at the time um, they said, well, you, you know, we could do 1%. Well, um, you fast forward today, we have a, about 14% of our employees on any given point in time on rotation to different areas. And that has resulted in um, really enabled this transformation because of that adaptability, flexibility, understanding of what other people do. And that's been an incredible on the job learning experience. Um, and we've been able to, uh, you know, meet needs of the organization by repositioning employees when we have an inability to hire, for example, um, and we're like, hey, you know, this particular person learned a new skill, and we, can, we can plug and play, you know, people in different places. And so that's been really successful. Um, and then I would just add, you know, from another, from a workforce pers perspective, um, you know, change can be scary. And one of the, the cool things, um, we have a pretty great leadership, actually a really great leadership, not only at GSA, but in the CIO's office. Um, and uh, David and Beth um, do AMAs on a regular basis, Ask Me Anything sessions. And, um, and folks are, are, they challenge um, a lot, you know, and, and uh, folks have direct access um, to our leadership team and to David and Beth on a regular basis. Um, and they're able to ask these um, questions. A lot of what the folks in the audience asked them, how are we doing this? We don't have the budget. How are we going to do this? Um, and, and they take them and, and they answer those head on. And so that has done a lot to prepare the workforce, um, but, but also create that cultural change that I think is necessary. Hey, hey, thanks, Erica. Cultural change is one of the hardest things a leader has to do. Uh, moving to slide nine, uh, because we're down to about the last seven minutes or so, what are some tips for change management and overall customer satisfaction that you can offer up to other agencies? Uh, okay, so um, it's a good question. Um, so I, I would say one of the, the tips I would say is to have, um, think about change management. Um, we, we, you know, we talked about cultural change, but having a dedicated team um, that looks at change management throughout the rest of the organization. So we have um, some change management experts that started small, and they're actually a really small team, but they do an incredibly effective job at creating, um, you know, Beth mentioned these kind of uh, training self-service vignettes. They're kind of short YouTube videos, um, really interesting ways of delivering information um, that people want to read. Um, very catchy, <laughs> it catches your eye, um, you start to look through it. 
um, and, and having UX, UI experts, uh, customer experience experts kind of weigh in on what you're trying to do. And that, that's really helpful. Um, uh, you know, again, that communication just cannot, you know, it, it's so important um, having that communication with not only the customer, um, your workforce and the larger employee base. Um, and then it just, uh, the UX UI, uh, incorporating usability into this digital transformation. When I talked about my experience in dealing with, you know, dealing with a car insurance organization, you know, I'm thinking through what's, what's the experience um, in this new environment going to look like for an employee? And is it better or is it worse? Um, and if you, can, if you can pinpoint that or even be able to describe that, um, you know, that that's, you're on your way. So uh, Beth, I don't know if you wanna to add to that. I think, you know, the only thing I will say is, is, you know, we're really trying to be proactive in how we engage our customers. And we're trying to think about things, not just customer satisfaction scores, but what is our, our customer experience score? What is our uh, net promoter score? We're thinking about how, do, what kinds of ways do our customers want to interact, just as Erica had talked about with her insurance example. You know, I, I mentioned to folks uh, when I first started, I was like, you know, I want to see IT uh, vending machines and people looked at me like I was crazy. You know, now they don't seem so bad because people can drive or come up, put their equipment in, not have to, to interact with a person, get it, come back out of the vending machine. We're talking about drive-by service. So, you know, what are we incorporating that, that may not even be technology-based that help our customers have a better overall experience and continue to share our brand with themselves and, uh, and across the federal government? That's really what we're trying to do, which is, you know, help them, you know, think about Amazon. You know, the next time you go in, it'll tell you five other things you might want to buy based on your previous purchases. That's what we're trying to get to. How do we take our customer engagement to that next level so that we can be uh, reading the, the intentions of our customers and proactively engaging on that so they don't have to uh, reach out to us, we're proactively reaching out to them. Thank you, Beth. Uh, David, unless you have something to add, I'd like to move on to slide 10 for the wrap up question. Nope, that's great. Perfect. Dave, I think you're the right guy to answer it. What will GSA be focusing on next? Yep. So I have three minutes. So I'm going to talk really fast. It doesn't mean I don't think this is important, but uh, it's important stuff to, I think, talk about. So we'll focus on the future of work. Uh, thank you for the partnership for some in this virtual room who've actually been working with us on our Workplace 2030 initiative, which is really a Workplace 2021 initiative since the entire federal enterprise has moved rapidly into um, new and uh, more effective ways to operate in a highly virtualized environment. Um, we'll continue to take a look at what the right tools are, what the right facilities are, what the right technologies are, what the right processes are um, to operate here in the 21st century. And GSA will have a material impact on um, and helping to provide a lot of that to the federal government, but we won't ever do to the federal government what we haven't tried and worked out ourselves first. So we'll take that proving ground model that I talked about earlier, take on first mover risk on behalf of the federal government, try it out on ourselves, and only express out to you and the larger community in partnership with our industry partners uh, what we've tried out on ourselves. That's a big area. Um, we will continue to look at uh, augmentation and predictive analysis. Um, you know, the work of government far exceeds the number of people working in government. So we'll be looking for ways to augment the, the wicked smart knowledge workers of the federal government with augmentative technologies so that we can be increasingly efficiently, increasingly efficient and meet the needs um, of the workforce of the federal government and the citizens that we serve. Um, we will continue to look at business enabled technology. You know, we're, we're a fully consolidated shop within GSA IT. Um, and part of that was, you know, we became, you know, we adhered to Fratara before Fratara was even really a thing with me controlling all IT budget and all IT systems and stuff like that. Um, part of that was consolidating all IT, but I've recognized that there is massive talent out in the business units of GSA that have significant material technology and business technology capability. I would be a fool to not exploit that capability out in the business units in which I serve. 
So we will be working very closely with the business units with the right controls, CIO type controls over that um, to, uh, to leverage that business enabled technology that allows us to you know, uh, be the most productive we can. And then the last thing is we'll continue to pivot towards uh, increasingly personalized service. You know, IT for the longest time said simplify and standardize. That's the way that you make money um, or save money. But we're not in the business of only saving money. We have to be good stewards of taxpayer dollars for sure. But we're in the business of enabling the business mission of GSA. And sometimes that includes um, deeply personalized service um, down to small, discrete, but powerful work groups within the organization who can work synchronously as a unit or asynchronously as an individual or as small operating, powerful out operating units and providing the technology they need for those small but powerful units to be highly effective in the domains in which they're operating in. So we'll continue to focus there as well. I think I wrapped up in time. Oh, I'm a half a minute late. I'm sorry about that. And David, it's your time, so that's okay. But we are out of time. I want to thank the panel uh, for their transparency and their willingness to answer any question that came from the audience. That's greatly appreciated. So with that said, Tom, back over to you, sir. Sorry, I was a little quick, a little late with the trigger there. Uh, thank you, John, and I and, uh, just wanted to thank GSA for doing this, David, Beth, Erica. That was fantastic. Uh, it was good to hear about this GSA uh, digital transformation journey, and we will definitely get those slides out so everybody can have them. Uh, just want to let everybody know uh, we've got a webinar tomorrow, and it, this has been a series we've uh, been working quite a bit with, uh, with uh, Sean Connolly, uh, on the TIC program manager and Jim Russo, but it's really, we wanna hear what's gonna happen in for TIC 3.0 in 2021. So we've got the big event for 1.30 to 2.30, our regular scheduled series of Thursday after lunch, but thank you all for participating. We've got a lot of great questions and everybody have a good rest of the week. Great. Thanks everyone.